We're here trying to practice right concentration. And one of the factors of right concentration on the beginning level is thinking. The Pali word vitaka is the general word for thinking. It doesn't have any special esoteric meaning. The Buddha didn't, didn't come up with a special esoteric word. He used the everyday normal word for thinking. But it goes together with evaluation. And again, it's the normal everyday word to evaluate something, to consider something, to investigate something. And the question is, Exactly how discursive does this thinking have to be, or can it be, to qualify as right concentration? But that's not the real question. Is the real question is, what kind of thinking do you need to do in order to get the mind to settle down? That's the kind of thinking you have to do. Each person's requirements are going to be different. So if you sit here with your eyes closed and you find that things settle down very quickly, things get very still, very refined, okay, the kind of thinking you're going to have to do will be very refined as well. In fact, you may not have to do much of that. You might just slip into the next level. But if you find the mind is not settling down, you've got to think. Ask yourself, what's wrong? What attitudes do you have that are preventing you from settling down? Or is there something wrong with the body? Is the body uncomfortable? Do you feel antsy? Do you feel like your energy level is too low, too high? You want to check things out. Think about what the problem might be and then evaluate the situation. Sometimes there are issues in your life. Things are not fair. Issues that it's hard to develop equanimity for. And so you have to think in ways that will allow you to develop, to develop that equanimity. I noticed when I was living with a John Furing, sometimes I'd ask him a Dharma question and I'd get a one-word, two-word answer. That was it. I realized what he was doing was giving me the one-word or two-word answer that should cut through the particular problem. These are the quick answers that he had learned how to develop over time. And it's not the case that you hear the two-word answer and then it's immediately going to work for you. You have to learn how to think your way there. So if you look at the world and find there's something that's got you upset, try to contemplate it in a way that helps you put it aside. And you think of all the injustices and all the unfairness in the world. Other people get away with all kinds of murder. And here you are trying to practice the Dharma and you feel like you're at a disadvantage. Well, they don't really have a long-term advantage. I notice this feeling coming up when I was staying with a John Fuang. A couple of monks in the monastery seemed to be able to do all kinds of things that John Fuang wouldn't let me do. He had me on a tighter leash. And there were times when I resented it. It seemed unfair. I would ask to do something they were doing. He said, nope. And they go out and They could go into town, they could do other things that I was not allowed to do at all. And I began to realize, however, that he, he cared more about me. Not that he loved me more than them, but he saw that there was more potential there, I guess. Or he was going to give me a better training. Saw that they would not respond to the harsher training, so he let them go. So it was his way of showing kindness to me. It took me a while to realize that. And I must have been difficult to live with until I realized that. But I had to think my way through to that. He didn't give a lot of explanations. And again, it was practice and meditation, learning how to think for yourself, figure things out. Which of your attitudes is the unskillful attitude that's going to make it difficult for you to settle down? And many times there are attitudes that you hold to very dearly, especially about issues of fairness. issues about the way things should be. 
but then there's that old story of the the hungry ghost up in the, the rafters of the meditation hall. A group of people have come, they're going to present a papa or gatin, and they're sleeping that night in the meditation hall, lined up, and there's a hungry ghost up in the rafters. And he sees it, looks down at them, and they look pretty disorderly. The heads are not in line. So it goes down, he pulls, pulls, pulls on them until their heads are all in a nice line. Then he gets up into the rafters, looks down, and notices their feet are not in line. So it goes down and pulls, 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 pulls on their feet until their feet are in line. Gets up at the rafters, ah, he notices the heads are out of alignment again. So the whole night gets spent this way. The moral of the story, of course, is there's a lot in the world you cannot straighten out. And the more you try to straighten it out, just the more you get yourself tied up in things that don't really accomplish anything. And especially right now, where you're sitting here with your eyes closed, it doesn't accomplish much to get yourself worked up about things. You need a still mind right now. It's only when the mind is still that you can begin to see things more clearly as they're actually happening for what they actually are. And whatever the type of thinking that's needed, if you find yourself suffering from bouts of lust, there are the traditional meditations on lust, and if the traditional meditation doesn't seem to work with your lust, we'll try to invent a new one that does. I'll just work on the variations. What kind of thinking, thinking would, actually, <coughs> would actually help you put that lust aside? And what thought in the mind is resisting the idea? Because many times the techniques will work if you want them to work. So you've got to work on the part of the mind that says, I don't want this to work, I'm going to stay with the lust. You have to reason with that part. The same with anger, the same with greed, any of the unskillful thoughts, even the seemingly skillful ones about quality, justice. For right now, you just put them aside. Even our best values have to have their time and place. And there are other times when, as right now, when you're trying to get the mind quiet, they're not going to be helpful because they're going to pull you away from what you're trying to do here, or at least what part of the mind is trying to do. So what this means is that the level of thinking you have to do to get the mind into right concentration depends on the, the level of disturbance, the types of hindrances you're dealing with, the types of defilements you're dealing with. That's why the thinking has to go along with evaluating. You check and see where your thinking is leading you, what's working and what's not. When you get the mind finally willing to settle down, and the thinking goes into a more subtle level, just thinking about the breath, asking yourself how you perceive the breath. Because there's the feeling of the breath, there's the perception of the breath, and the thinking about the breath. How do these mental functions interact? When you perceive the breath is uncomfortable, well, think about it for a while. What kind of breathing would make the body more comfortable? And if thinking doesn't seem to be getting anywhere, just watch the breath for a while. One of the ways of getting the breath more refined is just simply to be very steady in your gaze at the breath. So the evaluating is always there in the background to help adjust the thinking so it's just right for what you need. And as you develop this sense of just right, you find that you can depend on yourself more and more. It's like getting your balance when you're trying to ride a bicycle. At the first you need, the first you need the training wheels. You need help. But if you depend on the training wheels all the time, you never develop your own sense of balance. comes a point where you have to take them off. In other words, you have to learn how to depend on your own 
powers of evaluation to see what works, to see what doesn't work. You may fall down a couple times, but after a while, as your sense of balance gets more and more steady, more and more reliable, you can take care of yourself. And it requires less and less thought, less and less evaluating. It becomes more and more instinctive. So the thinking and evaluating may be awkward in the beginning. But over time, as you get a sense of what's working and what's not working, they get more and more refined. And as for when it turns into the kind of thinking and evaluating that's a factor of jhana, the line is not all that clear. But you begin to notice that the mind feels more settled, more refreshed, more at ease with the breath, more at ease in the present moment. There's a quality of ease and refreshment that then you can then spread through the body. That spreading is also an aspect of thinking and evaluating. As you work it down through the nerves, down through the blood vessels, out to your toes, out to your fingers, out to every pore all over the body, the thinking gets more subtle. The rewards get more and more riveting, more and more appealing, absorbing. It may not <coughs> seem like you're doing any thinking at all, but there's a very subtle level of thinking there about where to direct the breath, what kind of sensations are best to spread, which ones are not good to spread. Because sometimes a moving sensation is what you need, sometimes a still sensation is what you need to spread. Again, you evaluate it. Your sense of balance grows stronger. Your sense of what's needed grows stronger. And then the next time you meditate, you find that you can't quite get to that same level of refinement right at the beginning. Well, again, notice that. Remember that if you allow yourself to get frustrated by that, it's going to be another problem you'll have to work through. So get quicker and quicker at putting that sense of frustration aside and just get down to work, doing whatever level of thinking and evaluating is necessary, is required, given the situation, given your current state of mind, given the current state of your body. In other words, you do what needs to be done. You think what needs to be thought through. And in this way, our concentration becomes right, as you develop a sense of just right in approaching the breath.